All the way my Savior leads me Cheers each winding path I tread Gives me grace for every trial Feeds me with the living Good morning, everybody. Chester ARP Church Devotional Podcast. I'm Clint Davis. Thank you so much for being with us. As we get started, 2 Samuel chapter 15. I told you last time that this function reigns supreme from really chapter 13 onward in the book of 2 Samuel, but certainly with the story of David's family and with his children. Absalom uh, kills his brother Amnon after Amnon raped his sister Tamar. Absalom has to flee. David mourns the loss of his son. He also mourns the loss of Absalom as Absalom is gone, and he mourns the fact and grieves the fact that his daughter Tamar was violated by her own brother. Just all kind of dysfunction here. Things are going pretty well in the kingdom, but at home, David's got a mess. And so now Absalom, after he flees, he returns in chapter 14, and now that he returns to Jerusalem, he sets up a conspiracy against his father David. Second Samuel chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. After this, Absalom got himself a chariot of horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom used to ride, rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when a man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, From what city are you? And when he said, Your servant is of such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say, See, your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. Then Absalom would say, Oh, that I were judge in this land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. And whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And at the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, Please let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed to the Lord in Hebron. For your servant vowed a vow while I lived in Geshur in Aram, saying, If the Lord will indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will offer worship to the Lord. The king said to him, Go in peace. So he rose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king at Hebron. With Absalom went two hundred men from Jerusalem, who were invited guests. And they went in their innocence and knew nothing. And while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithopel, the Gileonite, David's counselor from his city of Giloah. And the conspiracy grew strong, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. So Absalom has decided that he is going to be king. He's going to overtake his father as king over Israel. Uh, There's a variety of reasons for that. We didn't read them. We won't go into them. But we just know that Absalom has decided that it is now time, he believes, for him to be king over the people of Israel. And so Absalom has a conspiracy plan. And every day he would go sit before the gate when people would come in to raise a dispute before the king. Uh, People would bring their concerns. David was the judge of Israel. He not only was the king, not only was the priest, but he was also the chief justice of Israel. And so people would come and they would bring their dispute. And Absalom would say to them, where are you from? And they would say, we're from such and such a tribe. And Absalom would say, well, there's no one here to represent you before the king. The king doesn't seem to care about you. The king doesn't want to hear what you have to say. He has no one to represent you. You have no lawyer. You have no one there um, who understands your situation, who could be a proper judge before you. The king is making his decisions. He really doesn't know what's going on in your life. If I were the judge, I would have do things differently. And so Absalom does this for four years. He ingratiates himself to the people. And they start to say, man, if this guy was king, if this guy was, was leader, if this guy was judge, he would do things differently and he would take care of my best interest. And so Absalom fools people into believing that he is going to be somehow the guy who helps them and gets them established and gets them uh, the best justice possible. Absalom's not interested in pursuing the Lord. He's not interested in seeking the Lord's advice. 
He's not doing any of that as David would be. He's simply saying, I would give you representation, and he gives the people exactly what they want to hear. He tells them what they want to hear and sells them a bill of goods that he has no ability to deliver. At the end of four years, he goes to his father and says, Hey, Dad, I want to go over to Hebron to worship because I made a vow. He uses his faith to say, I made a vow while I was living in Gersher, or Gesher, and as I was living in Gesher, I made a vow that if you brought me back to Jerusalem, I'll go offer my worship to you in Hebron. And so he is allowed to go, his father, of course, saying, go for it. I mean, why would you not tell your son to go worship God? And so he says, go for it. But as he goes, he continues in his conspiracy, and he sends secret messengers throughout the land to say that um, when they hear the trumpet, they are to cry out, Absalom is king at Hebron. And he sets himself up against his father. Now, last time we talked about this, that David had issues at home because he let things go at home. He didn't deal with those things, and it caused tremendous issues. But let's take a moment to focus in on Absalom here. Absalom is a man who kills his own brother in defense of his sister. Now, we probably have no problem with that. When we think about that, we probably think, man, that's what he should have done to protect his sister and to avenge her, the fact that she was raped by her brother. He flees, and when he flees, he is kept from the people of God. He is kept from the worship of God. He is doing all things on his own, and he becomes more and more set in his sin and in his brokenness. Instead of expressing forgiveness and working through those matters with reference to his brother and to his family, he becomes hard-hearted. And as he becomes hard-hearted, sin begins to eat away at his conscience. And he comes back to Jerusalem, and he has a desire when he comes back to Jerusalem, and he gets irritated about Joab and others, he has a desire to take over the leadership from his father. And so as he does that, he gets angry after living in Jerusalem, coming into the king's presence, etc. He gets angry with his father, and as he gets angry with his father, he decides he wants to create this conspiracy against him. And he does create this conspiracy against him. But the point of this, the, the message today is that sin begins to compound and compound and compound. David allowed it to compound in his life, but Absalom is responsible here. And Absalom has created this horrific situation for David and his desire to go against the will of the Lord and to exalt himself over his father David. And that is... Uh, problematic on many different fronts for the people of God, for Absalom, for David, for all involved. And we have to be careful to keep watch on ourselves, to keep ourselves from going in the same direction. We need to make sure we're humbly relying upon the Lord. You guys take care. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. You carry me close to your heart and surely your goodness and mercy will fall